The NCLEX loves to test about infection, bleeding, and fatigue. And guess what? Anemia and leukemia is a topic that covers all three of those things. So if your patient has low blood counts, would you know what to do? Well, I'm Dr. Emily, and today we're gonna break it down. So anemia occurs when you've got low RBCs, hemoglobin or hematocrit, which decreases the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and decreases oxygen delivery to the tissues. So this is gonna cause hypoxia and your patients are going to be weak, pale, and short of breath. And this can be caused by a number of different things like chronic blood loss, that might be in a slow GI bleed, increased destruction of the blood cells like in hemolytic or sickle cell anemia, or a decreased production of blood cells, commonly from nutritional deficiency anemias like iron, B12, or folate deficiency. So iron deficiency anemia is caused by poor iron intake or by increased iron demand, like in pregnancy. And B12 deficiency is gonna be caused by decreased animal intake, like in a vegan or vegetarian diet, or by impaired absorption of B12, like in pernicious anemia. And this occurs commonly after a gastric bypass because bypass removes the parietal cells of the stomach, which produce the intrinsic factor that's necessary for B12 absorption. Then folate deficiency is also caused by decreased folate intake, like in poor diet or alcoholism, or an increased demand for folate, like in pregnancy. So pregnancy is gonna put them at risk for two different kinds of nutritional deficiency anemias. So what do we see in anemia? Well, remember in anemia, we've got decreased oxygen delivery to the tissues or hypoxia. So we're gonna see fatigue and weakness. They're gonna have pallor because of that impaired oxygen perfusion to the skin. And then because the body's trying to compensate for that hypoxia, they're gonna have tachycardia and dyspnea on exertion. And we also might see some symptoms that are specific to different different nutritional deficiency anemias. So iron deficiency anemia causes something called pica. This is commonly in like a pregnant woman who's craving non-food items like ice or dirt. And that's just because the body is desperate for nutrients any way it can get them. And because B12 is necessary for neurologic function, B12 deficiency can cause neurologic symptoms like paresthesias and a beefy red tongue called glossitis. So what do we do for patients with anemia? Well, we want to monitor their H&H &H and anticipate a possible transfusion if it gets too low or if there's acute blood loss. And to manage that fatigue, you want to teach them to alternate activity and rest. So for household chores, for example, they might work on one they can do standing, like washing the dishes, and follow it with one they can do seated, like folding the laundry. And of course, you want to identify and treat the underlying cause. And on the NCLEX, this means you need to know which foods to encourage them to eat to address their specific kind of anemia. So there are a ton of food sources that will contain any of these, but these are the ones that the NCLEX likes to focus on. And I like to remember the ones for iron deficiency as the blood and the baby or red meat and eggs. So red meat is red because it contains blood and we know that blood is full of iron and then eggs, that's the baby, is also gonna contain a bunch of iron as the building blocks for the blood. And then apart from these, iron can be found in liver and green leafy vegetables, which are just really nutrient dense foods. So the liver, remember, is the storage organ in the body, so it contains a bunch of iron. But if they don't eat animal products, green leafy vegetables is a good plant-based source of iron. And then B12 is also found in the blood and the baby for the same reason, that's the red meat and eggs, as well as in dairy, which is also meant for the baby. And folate deficiency is not as big of a problem in the US as it used to be because our cereals are now fortified with folate. So if you've ever noticed that your breakfast cereal smells a little bit like a multivitamin, that's why, because it's fortified with folate. And this can also be found in those really nutritious foods of liver and green leafy vegetables. So if you see red meat, eggs, liver, or green leafy vegetables as an option on an anemia item in the NCLEX, there's a safe bet it's gonna treat at least one of these types of anemias. But if they can't get enough in from dietary sources, they might need supplementation. So iron deficiency is treated with ferrous sulfate, but this can be really hard for the body to absorb, so we need to teach them to take it correctly. So they'll want to take it between meals with vitamin C, like an orange juice, but not with any milk or antacids, which can impair iron absorption. And you definitely wanna warn them about these side effects of black stools and constipation. So black stools would be a warning sign for a GI bleed in a different client, but in these patients taking iron, it's expected. So be sure to warn them so they don't freak out. B12 deficiency is treated with cyanocobalamin, and it's important to remember that lifelong B12 injections are required after gastric bypass. This is because bypass has removed those parietal cells, so they can't produce intrinsic factor to absorb oral B12, and they need to take it by injection. And to prevent folate deficiency, all pregnant clients need to supplement folic acid, like in their prenatal vitamins, to prevent 
neural tube defects. So for our first NCLEX quick check on anemia, pause and take a second to see if you can answer these. So if you're ready for our first question, what foods should a client with iron deficiency eat? Remember, that's the blood in the baby or the red meat in the eggs, as well as those nutrient-dense foods, liver, and green leafy vegetables. Next, what should you teach clients undergoing gastric bypass? Remember, they don't have parietal cells, they can't absorb oral B12, so they need lifelong B12 injections to prevent pernicious anemia. And what should you teach a client taking supplemental iron? And supplemental iron, remember, is hard to absorb. So they'll want to take it between meals with orange juice, not with milk or antacids, and you need to warn them about those black stools and constipation. Now on to leukemia. So leukemia is a blood and bone marrow cancer that causes uncontrolled production of immature white blood cells. So that proliferation of immature white blood cells is going to replace the bone marrow, effectively crowding out production of their healthy blood cells. So we're gonna see a decrease in red cells, white cells, and platelets. So decreased red blood cells called anemia is gonna cause weakness, fatigue, and everything else we just talked about. Decreased white blood cells called neutropenia is gonna put them at risk for infection. And decreased platelets called thrombocytopenia is gonna increase their risk for bleeding. And if your patient has all three of these things together, that's called pancytopenia, or being low in all of their blood cells. And there are different types of leukemia. So leukemia can either be acute or chronic, and it can be lymphocytic or myeloid, where lymphocytic leukemias affect lymphoid stem cells and myeloid leukemias affect myeloid stem cells. And on the NCLEX, these are all treated the same way, so you don't need to worry too much about the difference. But if you need to remember it for your nursing school tests, we have some mnemonics to help you out. So acute lymphocytic leukemia affects all little lads, so that's more common in children. Acute myeloid leukemia is a mean leukemia, so this is the one that's most commonly fatal and progresses rapidly. Then chronic lymphocytic leukemia comes late in life, so this more often affects older adults. And then chronic myeloid leukemia, that's the chromosome mutation leukemia. So this is the one caused by that mutated Philadelphia chromosome. So what does leukemia look like? Well, remember, this is gonna cause pancytopenia. So low red blood cells creates an anemia and everything we just talked about. Low healthy white blood cells puts them at risk for infection, and low platelets is gonna cause bruising, bleeding, or epistaxis, which is a nosebleed. And because this is a cancer, you're gonna see systemic findings as well, like weight loss, swollen lymph nodes, and bone pain. And leukemia is diagnosed using a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, or a BMAB. And this is where a needle is injected into the bone marrow space, usually in the back of the pelvis, and that bone marrow is aspirated and studied under a microscope. And that's gonna show loss of blast cells, or immature white blood cells. But because this injection is into a very vascular space in a client who already has thrombocytopenia, they are going to be at high risk for bleeding after this procedure. So post-procedure, be sure to apply a pressure dressing to the site to stop that bleeding and report any signs of bleeding or infection. So once they're diagnosed, what can we do for them? Well, we need to monitor their CBC to trend the severity of that pancytopenia and know about their risk for infection, bleeding, and anemia. And we do that while we prepare them to undergo chemotherapy and or a stem cell transplant. And in the meantime, we want to address their anemia as well as their risk for infection and bleeding. So for the anemia, we'll manage that fatigue by teaching them to alternate activity and rest. And it's very important to limit their risk for infection because this is a major killer in clients with leukemia. So do you remember the most important intervention for infection control? And it's a simple one, that's strict hand hygiene. We wanna practice strict hand hygiene and we wanna teach them to do the same. We also wanna teach them to limit their exposure by avoiding crowds and sick contacts. And remember, these clients really have no immune system, so you need to notify the healthcare provider for even a low-grade fever. Just one degree Fahrenheit or half degree Celsius above their baseline could indicate a life-threatening infection. And of course, we need to implement neutropenic precautions, and for their risk for bleeding, we need to implement bleeding precautions. And the NCLEX is gonna make sure you know what goes into these because these are big safety concerns. So do you remember what's required for neutropenic precautions? Well, we wanna put them in a private room with dedicated equipment so they don't swap any bugs with a roommate and they cannot have any fresh flowers or raw foods because these can harbor bacteria. And then for bleeding precautions, we want to avoid invasive procedures like intramuscular injections, don't give any aspirin because that's an antiplatelet, and then teach them to avoid forceful nose blowing because that can cause epistaxis that doesn't stop. 
and then to limit nicks in their gums or skin, teach them to use a soft toothbrush and an electric razor, and then notify the healthcare provider for any unusual bleeding. So obviously it's not unusual if we discontinue an IV and it bleeds for longer in these clients, but it's unusual to see bleeding from somewhere we're not supposed to, like petechiae or bleeding from their gums or in their stool. And definitive treatment with leukemia is with chemotherapy and or a stem cell transplant. So while they're undergoing chemo, we wanna address the side effects of chemotherapy by giving antiemetics, performing gentle oral care, and monitoring their CBC, especially during their nadir, which is that lowest point in their neutrophil counts. And this usually occurs about one week after their chemotherapy treatment. And then after chemotherapy has destroyed that cancerous bone marrow, they might undergo a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And this is where healthy donor stem cells are administered by IV and they graft into the bone marrow and start to produce normal healthy cells again. But if those donor stem cells start to produce autoantibodies against the host, this creates a kind of acute rejection called graft versus host disease. And this is going to cause some nonspecific findings like rash, liver dysfunction, and diarrhea. So be sure to monitor for these like monitoring their liver enzymes and notify the healthcare provider of any changes. Now for your NCLEX quick check on leukemia. So pause and take a second to see if you can answer these. So if you're ready, what three complications are clients with leukemia at risk for? And remember, their bone marrow is not producing healthy blood cells, so we're going to see pancytopenia, causing anemia, infection, and bleeding. And how high of a fever should you notify the healthcare provider of for a client with leukemia? These clients don't really have an immune response, so even a one degree Fahrenheit or half a degree Celsius elevation in their temperature above the baseline can indicate a life-threatening infection. Now, what two things do you need to have in place and what two things do you need to avoid for somebody on neutropenic precautions? And because of that risk for infection, remember, we need them in a private room with dedicated equipment so they don't swap bugs with their neighbor and don't allow any fresh flowers or raw food, which harbor bacteria. And finally, what three things should you avoid in bleeding precautions? And for these clients with thrombocytopenia, we need to avoid invasive procedures like IM injections, no aspirin, and no forceful nose blowing. So I hope that was helpful and thank you for joining me. And now you're ready for anemia and leukemia on the NCLEX.